Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to Bold Academy. Um, if you have any questions throughout our workshop, um, please put them in the Q&A box. They'll be answered at the very end. Um, and yeah, we'll be closing the chat um, once we get into the workshop proper. But in the meantime, feel free to introduce yourselves, tell us uh, where you're coming from, uh, tuning in from, and uh, yeah. We'll get started in a bit just to let folks come in. Um, as you know, this is the final Fold Academy workshop of the season. Uh, we'll get started in a bit so that folks who've registered have time to join us. Again, feel free to introduce yourselves. Um, and in the chat, uh, once the workshop gets underway, we will close that. It'll be very exciting to talk about speculative fiction. I'm very excited for this workshop. All right. Um, as people are filtering in, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Ardo uh, Omer. I am the Kids Coordinator at the Festival of Literary Diversity, commonly known as FOLD. You are currently tuning in to the final FOLD Academy workshop called Building Fantastical Worlds with Nafisa Azad. Um, you are, um, I'm going to introduce Nafisa. Uh, Nafisa Azad is an award-winning Indo-Canadian Muslim author. She's the co-editor of the Young Adult Nonfiction Anthology Writing in Color, which I do have a copy of. If you see right here. Um, and uh, she's also the author of many novels, including The Candle and the Flame, which won, which was nominated for the William C. Morris Award, uh, The Wild Ones, and as well as The Road of the Lost, which is her more recent one. There we go. Oh, no, I've disappeared completely. Um, but that's just an idea of uh, what is to come. Oh, chat is disabled. Sorry, guys. Let me make sure everyone here can enjoy um chat there we go uh chat is now enabled um yeah so uh nafisa is also the full 2024 teen writer in residence uh so she'll have a young adult panel uh as well at the festival so look out for that and she's been creating fun videos for the fold kids uh, social media account Again, if you have uh, any questions, put them in the Q&A box and they'll be answered at the end. We'll have a chunk of time dedicated to that. Uh, it's lovely to see uh, folks uh, letting us know where they're from, uh, exciting. Uh, and yeah, so I'm going to actually bring up the star of the show, Nafisa. Hello. And yeah. Hello, and I will leave you all in her much capable hands for this lovely <laughs> workshop on building fantastical worlds. Take it away. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I see that there's someone here from Sacramento. Wow, how awesome. And there's someone also here from um, 
Vancouver Island, we're up early, aren't we, on a Saturday? Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about building fantastical walls. I am going to, I have a lecture prepared for you. And I believe once we're done, um, there'll be a Q&A period where you can ask your questions. So before I start talking about building walls, um, please note that while I am going to be focusing on fantasy world building, isn't necessarily limited to the fantastical genre. Uh, no matter what kind of fiction you write, you will be creating a world in which the characters of your story exist an adventure. Um, so learning to world build is essential in storytelling. Even if you're writing contemporary and realistic fiction, you will still be creating a world that is normal to your characters. While the physical landscape may be identical to the real world, certain things will be exclusive or unique to the story and your characters. And that is the part of the world you will need to create. With that said, let's jump straight into my favorite part of writing, world building. Different writers have different craft practices. I shall share mine with you in case it resonates and you want to do the same. This practice is, is a, this is a track, trusted practice of mine and walks wonders, especially if you write complex tales. I usually get a fresh notebook um, every time I start a new walk in progress. I use it religiously through the drafting process. All my world building notes go in there as do character profiles, questions and answers and aesthetics. Um, in short, everything I do to deepen my understanding of the story I'm telling and the world I'm creating will be found here. This is uh, the notebook for a recent fantasy I did. So let me just show you. This is, I write the premise of the story first and then I make some aesthetics. That's where Pinterest comes in handy. And then I will do character profiles, try to understand the characters. And you know, just a lot of pictures to inspire myself. And then because I'm a pantser, which means I um, plan as I pants, I plan each chapter before I write it. I tend to um, plan each chapter as I go. This is the maps I drew because I don't, I'm not a very good artist, but I need to see where, um, it sometimes helps to see the spaces in which your characters exist. So you don't have to be an artist to draw all of these. And this is the first one. And this is the um, one I drew, I did for um, Road of the Lost. So I try to make mine as pretty as I can because everything, when you're writing a book, your head, in, the inside of your head is still chaotic. So you want to keep your um, um, notes very pretty and aesthetic as my um, niece says. So yeah, I would recommend you do the same because it's great to have a book while you're writing a book and you can see your book grow as the world you create um, increases and becomes more defined. Yeah, um, if you're new to writing or have just started a novel and are still figuring, slowly figuring things out, one of the most useful ways to learn how to write, and I recommend this, is to read and reread the books that most speak to you. Um, don't read it for pleasure. Read it to learn. Deconstruct these books. See how the authors of these books build their walls and do the same. Emulate them. Notice their world building styles. See how they begin chapters and transition from one scene to another. See how they use pacing. Um, what techniques do they use uh, to when they want the pace to be quick and when they want to slow the pace down? Um, do they rely on description or do they weave the information into their um, the, the narrative? Now, before you start world building, I would recommend that you first figure out the kind of world you're building and to what degree you want to build it. For instance, High fantasy requires an entirely fictional world, and you can decide which elements of the real world you want to keep and which ones you want to make up. 
um, do you want to come up with different units of measurement or are you keeping the ones that we use in the real world? Are the days of the week going to be called the same thing or are you coming up with something else? So on and so forth. One of the things I recently learned is that if you are creating an entirely new world, it is supremely helpful to write a set of mythology or stories that have evolved with this world. Doing this gives your world some flavor, gives it, makes it feel realer and more organic. Yes, you'll have to do a lot more work this way, but once you're done, your world will be far more convincing than otherwise. Portal fantasy features the real world and the fictional world. So you will need to differentiate between the two worlds to a discernible degree. Um, if your characters are traveling from one world to another, you can ask yourself how you can disrupt their sense of space and time in the two worlds and springboard your world building from there. You can read the more successful portal fantasies and subvert the genre where it is earth that is strange and the fantastic that is normal. Urban fantasy is where you, you usually create a world within a world. I did this with The Wild Ones. This is my sophomore novel. And I shall share an excerpt with you to show you how I went about doing something. So the book is in... Um, First person plural. So, we look around as we walk, catching glimpses of the middle world here and there. That glint you see in the corner of your eye, or that time you thought you saw something move in the shadows, is the middle world. The store you so swore had never been, you had never seen before, or the alley that springs up suddenly one day, only to be gone the next. Human beings, as a rule, are completely blind to the middle world. Even when they see middle worlders who are not at all human-looking, their brains normalize whatever they are seeing. They are unable to see the, the true selves of middle worlders unless the middle worlders want them to. So, um, yeah. You can also create a fictional world, kind of a fictional country or space in a corner of the real world, as I did with the candle and the flame. In this case, you can use certain elements of the real world as you desire, but add more as your um, story demands. One of the pros to doing it this way is you don't have to write the mythology of this world because you can just use the ones pre-existing. Um, many other genres exist, such as fantastical realism, where the fantasy is usually limited to one single element that takes the bulk up, that takes up the bulk of the narrative attention. You don't have to exactly categorize the genre of your work in progress, as long as you have an idea of the type of world you want to build. Keep in mind, though, that all successfully created worlds persuade the reader or audience to suspend the disbelief and immerse themselves in this world. To a certain extent, they hold the readers captive, blurring the lines between reality and fiction. As soon as someone says, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense, the spell is broken. And they step out of the world without any guarantee they will return to it. When the illusion fails, the world fails and your story will inevitably fail. So unless you are intentionally writing an absurdist fantasy, think Hitchhiker's Guide to the uh, Galaxy, though that would be science fiction, I believe, walk with logic. Even the fantastical has to follow reason and make sense. You have to set down the rules of the world before you begin to break them. Now that we have settled the process before you begin world building, Let's talk about some aspects of the craft. In my experience, there are three elements to world building. One, the setting, two, the characters, and three, the conflicts. These three elements feed off each other in very important ways. In Among Others by Joe Walton, the protagonist muses that all living beings 
are created by the landscape, the environment they live in and they grow up in. The setting creates the characters and the conflicts and the characters in turn further or resolve the, these conflicts. Let's walk with setting and characters first. Some people meet the characters of a story first and then create the setting that go along with these characters and others create the characters um, and the others create the setting first and then create the characters most of the times personally I get the characters first to give you a glimpse of my world building process I'll share the premise of a current walk in progress of mine the premise goes thus the protagonist in my unnamed novel was a servant in, a, in the house of an immortal. And one day, this immortal bumped into her, causing her to splash the tureen of hot soup she was carrying onto his body. He, being an unreasonable and arrogant ass, curses her to die an early death a thousand times. Fast forward 999 lives and deaths later, my protagonist awakens to her final life in the world she originated from with more power in this life than in any other she has lived. She knows she's going to die early, but this time she's determined not to die alone. This time she's going to take the immortal with her. So that's the premise. Now to build my world around this protagonist who remembers all her many deaths and lives, I have some of the many questions I must ask are, are immortals common in this world? If so, how do humans compare to the immortals? Who are the political leaders in this world? Um, what is the physical landscape like? Do the immortals and the humans live in one place? Is the story going to be focused in one geographical location? What is the magic system? What does power mean to the protagonist? Do immortals eat? What does my protagonist like to eat? Is the food she likes readily available? How? Who grows farm set or farm set? Does she have a family? Does she tell her family about her past lives? If so, if yes, why? And if, and if not, why not? Similarly, if you have a protagonist who, I don't know, who likes to eat rice, ask yourself, why does the character like to eat rice or fries or whatever is rice readily available if yes where does she live that it is available if not is she too poor are her parents too poor what kind of jobs does she or do her parents do that they are not able to afford the rice is there someone in her circle of friends or acquaintances for whom rice is readily available Back in the day when the YA genre first started getting popular, there were many instances of strong female protagonists who were not like the other girls and were outspoken, brash, and entirely distinct from um, any other female characters in the book, um, what we'd call a special snowflake. I mean, I, I actually like special snowflakes because it's fun to read about them, but snowflakes anyway while she was distinct however she was not a product of her landscape if women were all taught to be quiet and not speak out where did she learn to be outspoken her, the actions of this um, protagonist and her attitude made no sense in the environment she grew up in she always felt artificial and not organic without explanation. If your protagonist goes against the grain as they all inevitably do, give them a solid reason to. Why is this character different? Did someone teach her to be that way? Did some experience change the, her personality? M make sure there's logic, there's reason behind the change. Otherwise, um, your story and your characters will read really hollow. Ask yourself these questions. Oftentimes, the answers will lead to your story gaining depth and twists in ways that may surprise you. For example, um, in a book I just finished writing, 
I had to figure out where the water in a certain place came from. I mean, I came to this question two thirds into the book. So I stopped and thought about it. Where did the water come from? There's no source nearby. So how does the water come? Where does the water come from? The answer to this que to the questions I asked myself evolved my understanding of this certain place to realize that whoever controls the water controls the place. And thus the leader of this place is one who distributes the water. So the person who wants to be leader does not just have to disarm the previous leader, but also find ways to break his monopoly on the water supply. So as you answer questions and go deep into the uh, rhetoric, you'll find that you mine, you excavate parts of uh, the story that were you know, just under the surface. So while the ideas would not have been present immediately, once you think about it, and these questions will lead you to think more about it, you will find yourself knowing your story better. If your setting comes first, write down a set of, no, 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 before that, when, when the story idea is shiny and new and you don't know it very, very well, it's best to sit down and ask it questions and then answer these questions in as much detail as you can. You will find that um, you understand your story a whole lot better after this exercise. You will also find that uh, you know, you realize which areas of your story you, you need to think about more, research more, and which story and which aspects you really enjoy and um, are proud of. So you want to develop that part more. On the other hand, if your setting comes first, if you find your setting, you're like, you know, I want to write a story set in a desert. Now what? Um, write down a set of questions that will help you create the characters who would be home in this place. It is best to be specific. Some examples of questions are, are the parents of your character still alive if you're writing a YA or short kidlet? If yes, and in the setting you already have, what social status do they have? If in this setting, the eldest, despite their gender, is the heir, is your protagonist the heir? If not, how do her siblings treat her? How does she treat her siblings? What if she's not the heir, but the strongest in magical abilities? What does this do to the relationship between the siblings? And how do you define power in this world? What does it mean to have power and what consequences are there to having none? Has the education your character received empowered her, even if she doesn't have the um, power? Is your protagonist timid being the youngest and without magical power? What is the inciting point? What pushes her to change herself? In the setting you have created, what can give her hope? And so on and so forth. Remember, that your characters have to be a certain way because of the landscape they grew up in. Um, if you want to change their personalities to be different, unique, you need to provide, as I said, a logical reason for this change. Maybe your parents die or they're killed because she doesn't have power and she decides, you know what? I am not going to live my life like this anymore. I am going to get this power and that will send her on a journey to, to gain the power she seeks. Now, before we get to conflicts, let us, let's answer a more practical question. How do you wall build? I mean, people talk about wall building, but really I have found that they talk about the practical aspect. How do you go about wall building? Um, telling is one way. It's not a very graceful way, but sometimes there is no option to tell. However, there are ways to make the telling smoother and less disruptive to the storytelling. If there's information that's imperative, the reader knows, have someone who is equally clueless ask a question. Someone more knowledgeable will answer, but the scene, of the entire scene info, info dumping will be within the scope of the narrative. So, so there'll be no authorial intrusion into the story. Oftentimes, authorial intrusion um, risks breaking the spell the the story has uh, been um, has been keeping the readers under under so 
try to distance the authorial voice from the narrative as much as possible. A more elegant technique, however, when world building is to weave the information you need to convey into the narrative. This is more work, but world building this way is a lot more organic. Of course, walking this way means placing more trust in your readers because you are asking them to make connections and draw inferences. Readers will become active participants in the story you're narrating. So the storytelling is becomes more of a collaborative project than the, simply the author telling and the reader reading. For example, the world you're building is a monarchy. Instead of saying there's a king and there's a queen, have the protagonist take a walk and see the castle or palace. Talk about the materials the palace is made of. Talk about the artisans who built it. Does the presence of the artisans, the stone walkers, say anything about the walls you're building? Are they still present? Are they still, were they left alive after the palace was built? Um, were they part of a guild? Or are they still a part of a guild? How important are guilds in the world you're, you're building? How grand is the palace in comparison to the houses of the common folk? If it's very grand, is the king a tyrant? Talk about the gods in front of uh, the palace. If there are many gods, does it mean the king doesn't feel safe? If he doesn't feel safe, is it because he's a tyrant and people are secretly rebelling? Or you can think about it in a different way. Say, everything, everyone in your story has names that don't have the letter D in them. Why? Perhaps they can't pronounce the letter D. In this world, the letter D is unpronounceable. Or perhaps the letter D is forbidden to them. Why? Maybe it's the tyranny of the king. The letter D is exclusive to the royal family. In that way, if your main character is given a name with the letter D in it, that could be the beginning of the rebel in her. And she goes to seek power. Another way to, another good way to wall build is with food. And I know something about this because I tend to write a lot about food. Um, ask, what are the kinds of foods your characters eat? Who cooks? What does that say about the domestic division of labor? Is there meat? What kind of meat? Fish? Is the fish caught or bought? Um, do people eat together? What relationships can you derive from the positions people take around the dining table? Can you tell which grandchild is more favored from, the, from their proximity to the grandparents' elders. Let's talk about the kitchen. What kind of spices can be found in it? Whose preferences determine, whose preference determines the ingredients in a meal? What kind of ingredients? Were they imported? Are there markets? What do the contents in the kitchen say about the financial state of the family, the economy of the world you're building? Describe the mode of transport. Talk about the roads. Who maintains the roads? Is it, is it the tyrant king? If, if it is the tyrant king, are the roads full of refuse and ill-maintained? Are people allowed to own horses, cars, or is that the privilege of the upper class? Maybe you can talk about your character's love of reading. You can show a lot just by talking about the character's love of reading. About the availability of reading material. Are the books she reads written by those in the upper class or can people, the common folk, write books? And if they can write books, who reads them? Are there libraries? Are there schools? Can anyone go to school or is that also a luxury afforded only to the upper class? Is society, is the society your main character, your characters live in homogenous or diverse? How? Why? One thing to be aware of while writing immersive setting is characters will not stop to explain themselves. They won't speak to the audience, but to each other. Unless, of course, you're experimenting, in which case they will. What is common to these to the characters may not be familiar to the reader, but that is not their problem. Think about it. Would you observe a landscape that you see daily? I mean, I don't think so. If I'm going to go from here to the grocery store, I would just be like, okay, cars on the road, whatever. 
not unless there's something unusual there, right? Um, the stretch of the road you pass will not warrant excessive comment unless an accident or collision disrupts the normalcy. So even if the reader is seeing this road for the first time, the speaking character won't stop to describe it in detail if nothing out of the ordinary has happened. Fleeting descriptions that build a hazy outline of the place, which is filled in as the story continues, are a better idea than exhaustive descriptions on every single page. Modern readers do not like descriptions all that much, especially kids. They they just dislike descriptions. I've as I have uh, um, learned from many comments. Trust that the reader has read enough books to fill in these outlines themselves. If you're writing something you think that most readers won't be familiar with. Resist the urge to stop and explain. Either write a glossary or make the action or word understandable through contest, context. Writing vibrant settings is intrinsic to world building. Use all the senses to evoke this, uh, to write the setting. Show what the reader will see, smell, hear, and feel through the characters in your story don't i wouldn't say to have a separate paragraph just saying you will feel blah blah just uh the the main character um wrinkles her nose at the stench of the refuse coming through from the roadside you know the tyrant king hasn't had the roads cleaned for a long time so <laughs> yeah something like that Which brings me to the perspectives you use to tell your story. Understand that the POVs, point of views you use can and will limit the amount of world building you're able to do. The first few drafts of um, The Road of the Lost that I wrote were written in first person. First person is great for many reasons, but especially because they drag the reader into the story immediately. This, the immediacy is, it's astonishing. You're just one minute, one sentence is all you take and you are in their head, seeing the world as they see it. Um, and first person POVs are extremely popular in YA for obvious reasons, but personally, I am frustrated by how limiting first person POV can be when you want to world build. You're always going to be reined in by what the character knows. And if your character doesn't know anything, you're not going to be able to talk much about, about you're not going to be able to talk about much until your character comes into contact and gains familiarity with the world. The richness of your world will be compromised a bit with first person POV. Now to, dis to uh, say a disclaimer here, it's probably me. I am not very good at um, world building in first person POV. So this could probably be untrue for someone who is. Um, I recommend that you try out a bunch of uh, POVs before committing to one to see what feels the most engaging and natural to you and to the world you're building. Additionally, the perspective you choose depends on the kind of story you want to tell. If you're telling a story about someone's coming of age, a building's woman, um, which features character growth as a major theme, then perhaps yes, first person POV definitely fits. But if you're telling a story about an entire kingdom where the focus is not on the characters but the plot, it might behoove you to use multiple POVs. Multiple perspectives will widen the lens, so to speak and your world will be more vividly represented than would be possible with just one point of view. The different ways different characters engage and interact with the world around them will be invaluable. It will be an invaluable technique in making the world you're building more vibrant. Now to go back to the conflict, um, the primary conflicts in your novel or story is also dependent on the world you have built. For instance, if you are in a world where physical fighting is unheard of and all wars are fought through intellect, you can break the law of the world by having someone initiate a physical fight. 
if the world you've created is lacking in, in resources such as food, the primary conflict will probably be initiated by this lack of resources as characters seek to change their circumstances and their ability to gain resources. The world you build and the characters who inhabit them serve to create and delineate the conflict you write. Think of Frodo from The Lord of the Rings. Hobbits, if I'm not wrong, are described as peace-loving creatures. It is perhaps this love of peace that is shown in the village where that is shown in the village they live in that gives Frodo the determination to undertake the mission of carrying the ring to its eventual end. If Frodo hadn't experienced the peace in his village, he wouldn't have been as easily moved to take up a task that felt almost impossible to fulfill. Also, Middle-earth is immense, which makes his task more arduous and more impossible, which makes for a better story than if Mordor had been next door. The books would have been way shorter that, that way. Um, finally, go back to the movies and books you most love or that have spoken to you. Think of the conflicts in them and how the walls they're set in push the story, the conflict toward the climates, toward the resolution. Say you've built a wall that is going to be destroyed by a meteor in six days. What are your characters going to do? What escape is there going to be? How are feelings intensified by the setting? What actions are possible in the face of desperation? To sum up the entire um, hour, the past hour, um, ask yourself questions. Then answer these questions and you will find that you are on your way to creating or building a fantastical world of your own. Um, here is a list of texts I use for craft, which also discuss world building. Um, the Tough Guide to Fantasyland by Diana Wynne-Jones. Craft in the Real World by Matthew Celesis. Manuscript Makeover by Elizabeth Lyon. She does talk very interestingly about perspective, so I recommend that. Um, Wonder Book by Jeff Vandermeer. Um, I haven't read this one, but I do own it and I do plan to read it. On Writing and World Building by Timothy Hickson. Another one I haven't read, but do own and do plan to read. Do you have questions? I'm done, Ardo. <laughs> I am back. I am back. Um, thank you so much. That was such a fascinating conversation on world building. Um, as a writer myself, I generally know these things, but we, hearing you talk about it is always refreshing. It's always like, you know, kind of like you're sharpening your writing knife in a weird way because you forget to like, whenever you're struggling with world building to like go back to basics of like, what are these things? And what I liked most is when you talked about setting creates the characters and mm -hmm. the characters either further the conflicts of that setting or help solve it. Yeah. Um, I think that was like a standout thing for me, as well as the idea of folk tales, folk tales in a world will also give you such great insight to that society as well. The, what are the stories that they're sharing with one another? So thank you so much for that. And of course, we have questions. So as I've been typing away in the chat box, uh, if you have a question, do ask at Nafisa. I'll start with uh, Laura's question because I've always wondered about this as well. Do you have any tips for world building on a smaller scale? Things like flash fiction and sto short stories. You know, they're very, like, short stories, <laughs> that's, what I would say is to, um, there's a history of uh, world building. Other people are familiar with literature. So I recommend you um, write a tale with, in a, set in a world or set in a type of world that is already prominent. For example, um, the Western fairy tale. People already know what's going on in there. So you are going to be borrowing, um, there's already a history of uh, tales, history of settings. So you're going to be using allusions. So, you know, because when readers read, they don't create everything from scratch. We have already seen um, battles take place. So we know we can create it in our minds as we read. So just allude to what has already happened and what um, um, readers might already be familiar with. But, but if you're creating something new entirely, I'd say go for the senses, talk, uh, smell, um, 
you don't have to waste towards space on what you see so much as you um, spend uh, what space on what you feel, what the character feels. Say they're walking through a forest and it's a kind of forest that has never been seen. The heat and then there are periods of heat, but there are periods of uh, intense cold. So what they feel, what they sense, what they smell, what they um, feel on the skin, focus on that, I'd say. <laughs> Yeah, I think that makes sense because you have such limited words to work with that it makes sense to have the more visceral things like smell, taste, touch, uh, working double time to also convey what the world is. I think it's really smart. Um, Emily wanted to know, what is your compass when you have multiple answers and possibilities to these questions you pose, but none are sparking you yet or speaking to you yet? Okay, so... The book I finished recently took me six years to write precisely because of this. So I would, I don't know if that's the right way to go, but I take what speaks to me most and explore it. Usually I go down the rabbit hole and I try to um, construct the world with a particular, say, if my a protagonist has parents compared to my protagonist doesn't has have parents what are the what is going to unfold or unfurl if she doesn't have parents how is the world going to flow how is the story i want to tell going to flow so pick the one if, even if it's not the best one just pick one and go down and start creating start asking your quest, yourself questions uh that way and then you know if you if you come to a place where like you know what I don't like it. You can go back. You don't have to start writing it. Just start asking yourself questions and you will inevitably reach a point where you're like, okay, I really don't like where this has gone. She has no um, anchor to whatever. Like there's no solid um, reason for her to, motive for her to act this way. And if she has parents, maybe she wants to get them back or they have been captured or kidnapped or whatever. So yeah, just choose one and go down the rabbit hole. You will find your way back or way forward. And sometimes, like you said, it takes time, right? Um, you maybe you're not in a place to write that particular story, or you need time to like marinate on it, right? Daydreaming is writing. Uh, yes. It's definitely writing. So it just might also mean um, thinking about it, because sometimes you'll experience something just out in the world. And you're like, oh my god, yeah, is that the direction I want to go with the story? So, yeah, definitely. Um, Arifa, Arifa uh, wanted to know, would you please tell us more about how a character can break out of societal norms if they've never seen that demonstrated in their community? Example, your example earlier of how a character might speak out if they never thought there was an option to do so before. Um, so I think it was the example of the special snowflake. Um, how, how can you um, have a character who can break out of societal norms if they've never seen that demonstrated in their community? I would say push her to desperation, to push her to a point where she has to speak out. Otherwise, um, the uh, repercussions will be beyond what she can endure. So even if she has never spoken out, you know, like, you know, if if she's in so much pain or if she, is, if she has so much rage, you can start by saying that she has noticed things more than other people have but she has not been able to speak out because in, a, in their culture, people just don't speak out. But these things have been um, accruing and she reaches a point where she has to speak out even though nobody else has or she'll be damning herself. And usually understand that every living creature will choose to save themselves. So her act of speaking out is an act of saving herself. So even if she has not, nobody has taught her to do it, her her own her own self her own inner um savior will push her to speak and um, you can also see like when you talked about like the idea of like the society of people who are quiet you're still gonna have people who are not quiet and they might have been treated terribly oh we're gonna get cat cat <laughs> cat yeah. appearance um but she may, this character may um, see how, like they may see examples of being outspoken, but it's just like not great consequences to it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's see. So someone asked, this is more technical in terms of your actual lecture mm -hmm. uh, as part of the workshop. Uh, you re Can you repeat the questions you had said right after the meteor in six days example? Okay, so uh, what are the characters going to do? What escape 
is there going to be for these characters? How are feelings intensified by the setting? What actions are possible in the face of desperation? This Amazing. is Madame. <laughs> we always like an appearance of a cat during a virtual conversation. All right, let's see what other questions we have here. Um, can you share more uh, about making conflicts emotional? Hmm. Depending on what kind of conflicts there are, like there are certain kinds of conflicts. For example, if you have no food, right? If there's a lack of resource, have someone die from a lack of food that's going to make it emotional immediately. Or um, you have someone who wants uh, to escape from somewhere, but to escape, they have to leave behind someone they love. That someone might not be in danger, but the person who wants to escape is. So, no, 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 cat, no. <laughs> so yeah, just introduce someone who is a weakness of the character and that will immediately make things um emotional sorry it's all I'm right emotional about this cat <laughs> <laughs> this cat is creating conflict for exactly. you in which you are now emotional um like a, a pet walks wonders by the way if if you kill a dog you're going to have a lot of angry readers but it's, the story is going to be very emotional <laughs> Don't, um, don't. Don't, don't, yeah. it's like now everyone's like so Nafisa said to kill animals yeah, in your story true. um so what's your opinion on using maps to present a world geographically at the beginning of a book I like it I mean I usually I mean we you and I all know that the presence of maps in a book depends on how much your publisher wants to spend on your book so even if you want maps your publisher might as well say there's no money but as um as writers, I know um, Kenneth Oppel has to have a uh, map of whatever he's writing to so that he can situate himself in the place. And I've noticed that if you're writing like a fantasy or something, it's helpful. If you've created the world in your mind entirely and you can't just go on Google and be like, hey, show me this. Um, it's helpful to, you know, sketch out the, the space in which uh, your characters are going to exist. Just so you can map how they move, the, the dynamic uh, um, movement of uh, their uh, of the of the journey you can map out the journey from one place to another even if it's only going to be in one city it's helpful to draw a map of your a sketch out a map of your city just to see how they go from one place to another so I like that I don't know about anyone else yeah as a reader I don't usually actually read like look at the maps <laughs> like um uh as part of the fantasy I don't usually refer to them but sometimes because it's so especially if, if it's um so plot heavy in terms of like they're going here and this is significant or whatever I do go back and go okay I'm a visual learner <laughs> where are these places right. in relation to one another um yeah. even though the description's great you're you as just as it's you know usually fantasy books are a big tome you're like I don't remember <laughs> let me look back to see what continent is this country on yeah um so yeah maps are great companions uh someone asked um some common advice is to write what you know. How do you interpret this? How do you do this? I mean, if you're writing fantasy, that doesn't really... I mean, you don't know any zombies or dragons. I mean, I wish I knew some dragons, but <laughs> <laughs> what you can do with what you know is not just... I mean, obviously, there's appropriation and cultural appropriation and stuff, and that's those are totally different conversations. But write what you know for fantasy authors would mean take the emotional um, learning you have experienced and apply them to the fantastic that you're writing. If you, you know, you've been in love a lot and have had your heart broken a lot, maybe you can write about something, you know, a girl who goes around murdering boys because you know she has had her heart broken you know add, add a fantasy element to it so I don't think you are limited by what you know in the fantastic genre of course there are ways to be respectful if you are if you are excavating um stories or mythology that you have no business mythology business touching then yes you shouldn't do that like if because stories are not only stories in certain cultures. Stories are sacred in some some cultures. And as people, we have to realize that 
for example, I come from Fiji, but I never write about the Fijian um, mythology because I don't think it's my place. It's not my lane. So I respect that. But do I take aspects of what I have experienced as a Fijian? Yes, of course. And I, the, the, the landscape, those are all mine. The uh, magic of the setting, th those are all mine. I can use those. But I don't think um, you can be limited by what you know in the fantastic genre. Yeah, I think this fantastic genre is kind of like this um, setting that kind of brings out the like emotional personal thing that is driving the story or this premise and you're right I, it's it's hard because it's difficult for me to talk about things like myths and folk tales in certain cultures because that suggests they're not real to those people and that's incorrect like for example I wouldn't touch indigenous stories because it's very real and it's very sacred and it's very important and it's not my place whereas I find like or as like with Greek mythology it's not a thing that is actively believed in in a way that it's not an act of culture in that way um or you have like somali folk tales fun stories but it's not to the same degree as like indigenous um stories that uh is passed down passed mm. around in that culture so yeah uh I, I i personally like to say i like to write i like to write stories with uh, with like an element of weird so <laughs> it's a story it has emotions but it's, you know, you put something weird in it that's not in our actual world. Um, so someone wants to know, what if you created, uh, what, hmm. okay, so what if you've created this wonderful, this amazing world and characters, but you haven't been able to think of the conflicts yet? So we actually have um, interesting conflict-related questions because someone also asked, um, can you share more about how you approach creating conflict and tension? So how do you approach creating it? And what if you can't really think of any yet? Okay, so you lay down the laws of the world you have created, right? Once you have done that, you break that law. And there you go. You have that conflict. So, for example, in a world where um, magic is, you know, maybe given uh, present only in boys, a girl is born who has the magic. There's the conflict. Or a world where um, everyone has a certain limited amount of time, where time is tangible. And then there's someone who goes out of time who has the ability to steal time from other people. And there's the conflict. What will happen to that girl? Who? What is, what is her motive? So I would say lay down the laws of the world and then break those laws. And once you break those laws, you have the conflict. It's very it's very simple in that way. I hope that helps. I think that does help, right? Conflict is essentially like what was broken, like what, you know, legal law or even uh, social law was broken and then go from there. I think that's a great way to approach it. Um, Pierre wanted to know, does a story in a fictional world have to always be dystopian? No. I don't like dystopian because it's, it's just so bleak. And right now the world is bleak as it is. I'd like to have um, happy stories. So no, it doesn't doesn't need to be dystopian. Yeah, dystopian is a very specific subgenre. Uh, whereas that doesn't mean your story shouldn't have conflict, but it won't necessarily be bleak. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's one question that's talking about a written list of the craft book recommendations. I'll just have... Nafisa send that to me and for our registered uh, registrants um, it'll appear in an email in about a week or so and for others who will be tuning into this on YouTube when it eventually comes out um, it'll be in the uh, captions so um, and then finally someone asked uh, last question do you follow or focus on GMC goal motivation conflict no <laughs> <laughs> really I, I was actually um I didn't even know that <laughs> so uh, the way I write a book I mean this might seem very crazy to a lot of people is that I write a zero draft I tell myself the story to figure out I write the book to figure out what the book is going to be about that's my zero draft and then once I've done I'm done writing the book I read it and I keep the elements I like and get rid of the ones I don't like and then I write a first draft so I actually write like entire sentences I'm not just talking about you know um, short sentences, fragments, I write the entire book. 
zero draft. This is so when so your zero draft, which to me just sounds like a first draft, but your zero draft is as long as a first draft would normally be. Manifisa, I can't do that. That's why it took me six years to write that book, you know. <laughs> that's that's the what's amazing about workshops like this is that you get to see all different approaches to writing from writers. Um, and so the goal, motivation, and conflict is like a fun way to plan out like what's your character's internal versus external goal, external and inter uh, and interior motive, and mm -hmm. internal and exterior conflict. That's I, something you guys can approach, but you know everyone does it differently. Yeah. I don't like. Uh, I feel like if I decided that beforehand, it won't feel as organic. So my characters tend to tend to change wildly from the first, uh, from the beginning to the end as they approach and have uh, uh, different experiences and meet different people that to, who change them in different ways. So I like to get. I like to retain that sense of uh, dynamic. You can you can uh, actually follow how or why the person changed throughout the journey through the book. So which is why I suppose I don't know GMC. <laughs> yeah I I just take notes I use things like GMC to kind of prompt me to think about things um but I just take notes before I'm finally at a place where I'm like I have enough where I feel like I can at least get started on a draft and oh. it'll still change but I, I I do a lot of daydreaming and just a lot of like random note taking like oh this is a great idea mm -hmm. um but yeah uh, that was our last question. First of all, amazing questions. Amazing questions asked by lovely people. Thank you so much for tuning in. Nafisa, thank you so much for your insightful workshop. Uh, it was fantastic. And to everyone who attended, thank you so much for spending the uh, weekend with us. Uh, the recording of today's event will be emailed to you within a week or so. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And we'll also make sure there's the list of those craft books as well. Um, thank you so much, Nafisa. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start uh, getting into our closing uh, housekeeping. Uh, so Nafisa is actually going to appear at a panel uh, for teens at full 2024 called Making Monsters. She'll be on with other young adult authors, uh, uh, Clara Kumagai, as well as Matteo El Sorelli. Um, it'll be moderated by yours truly. Uh, and if you haven't already registered for Fold 2024, you can do so at thefoldcanada.org slash register. We have a ton of great virtual and in-person events taking place from April 28th to May 5th, which is gonna happen soon. But otherwise, have a lovely rest of the day. Bye.